My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here, and welcome to the third and final sermon of our brief series entitled The Moral of the Story, a cursory review of a few of Jesus' parables. By now, you know that parables are stories employed to teach a lesson. They are succinct narratives that teach a universal truth using symbolism, simile, and metaphor. If you could take a Stroll in your memory back to English class where a simile is a comparison using the terms like or as, and a metaphor is a comparison without using the terms like or as. And Jesus used these parables to teach those whose eyes and ears were opened by the Holy Spirit to see and hear the true meaning or the moral of the story. Let's approach the Lord in prayer, thanking him that today he has empowered us to study his word and to walk away with understanding. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that by your Holy Spirit you give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And as we read from your word today, we ask that you open up our hearts to understand. We trust you. We rest in you. I ask, Lord, that you would use me as your vessel, that I be faithful to proclaim your word as it is written, and that this would be to your glory. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's parable is called the Parable of the Ten Virgins. It's found in Matthew 25, uh, verses 1 to 13. And let's read there together. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Before we study any passage of Scripture, we must understand the Scripture in its literary and grammatical context. In modern Christianity, we've developed the habit of taking verses out of the Scripture and then using them uh, to apply them as we see fit. Uh, Maybe even just putting them on a coffee mug. And while that's great that we can remember those Scriptures, when we take them out of their context, we don't always understand entirely what they truly mean. We have to remember that when the Bible was written, it was not originally written with chapters and verses. Those were added later so uh, we could better study and remember the scriptures. So it's wise for us to start our study this morning or this afternoon or this evening with uh, a contextual look of what's happening when Jesus gives this parable. Jesus has just finished delivering prophetic judgment to the religious leaders known as the scribes and the Pharisees. He has since left the area of the temple, and in our passage we find him speaking privately with his disciples in what is known as the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is teaching them as he sits on the Mount of Olives. Jesus, when delivering these oracles of woe to the religious leaders, speaks of his second coming, and then privately tells the disciples of the destruction of the temple. And so the disciples, as they hear these revelations, are naturally inquisitive as to when these events that Jesus has described, when they will occur. And so they ask him to explain. And so Jesus is answering their questions, and we arrive here for our study today in the middle of his conversation with them, answering a question about the time of his return. His return, you ask. Yes, his return. Jesus has been crucified, he's been resurrected, and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. The very same Jesus who died for your sins, who was resurrected to defeat sin and death, is now in the place of honor in the highest heavens, and he will return again to, one, gather his people unto him, two, to judge the living and the dead, 
and three, to establish a new heaven and a new earth in which all who have their faith in, tr- in Jesus Christ will live in eternity with him. For some of you, that's not news. That's the blessed hope. This is the hope you have as a Christian, and you've been looking forward to this time for years. For others of you, you may not have realized that Jesus is indeed coming back, that there is going to be a judgment at the end of time as we know it, and that until the appointed time of his return, we are given opportunities now to embrace Jesus Christ's rightful place as Lord of our lives and to experience spiritual renewal as we grow in deeper relationship with him. Now, there are many theories and approaches as to what events must occur first or what order of things happen before Jesus returns. And there are some approaches that have some more validity than others. But we must recognize that Jesus was not teaching his, stu- his disciples to become students of tabloids and newspapers and moons and stars. The disciples ask a good, legitimate question. Jesus, when are you coming back? And Jesus answers them in Matthew 24, 36. He says, the time and the hour is unknown. It was not revealed to them then, and it is not revealed to us now. It's not for us to know when. Now, there are signs of his coming as detailed in Matthew 24 and elsewhere in the scriptures, and some of those are wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and persecutions and false prophets and nation rising against nation. But we've seen a lot of that since Jesus ascended to heaven. And it's silly for us to say, oh, this must be the one or this is it or it's happening tomorrow or I saw this moon and it was red and therefore, no, that's not what Jesus was teaching us. Because the second we claim to know when Christ is coming back, we contradict the scripture that says the time and the hour is unknown. And those who tell you, by the way, that they know when he's returning are false teachers. Jesus is practical. He says the time and the hour is unknown, but that the return, his return, will be very sudden. He gives his parable, his disciples, a parable about his return, its suddenness, and the way that we are to wait for his return. And it's this parable that we've just read today, the parable of the ten virgins that he gives to describe the suddenness of his return. The parable focuses around 11 main characters, one bridegroom, simply a groom, and ten virgins. The bridegroom in the parable is Jesus. Now, don't get caught up in the virgins thing here. These aren't ten virgins awaiting a bridegroom because they're all about to marry the same man. Those who say this parable supports polygamy, or even if it really says anything about marriage as we know it at all, misread the text. These are virgins, which simply means they're young and or unmarried women, and they have been given the task to guide the groom to the marriage ceremony and to the feast or the reception. Ten people, in this case, ten young women, who signed up to be lamp holders. They were told, listen, at any moment, at any time, the groom's going to show up. We don't know when, but we know it's going to happen. Your job is to respond quickly when we sound the alarm and to bring your lit, your lit lamps with you to guide the groom to the ceremony. And of the ten people, the ten virgins who took on that task, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Now let's talk about the five foolish first. Their job was to provide light, to guide the groom on the path, to illuminate his coming. And the oil is the means by which their job is done. You cannot do the job of a lamp holder without the oil. They received their lamps, and I can kind of picture them as to how this might have gone. They were probably hanging around at the market or at the well, and and they were talking with people, and they go, oh yeah, you know, I've been a lamp holder for a while now. You know, it's not easy work. All glory to the Lord. You know, I am on call 24-7, 365, but I know, I know. Don't thank me. Thank God. He's the one who gives me the strength to be my lamp, to be the lamp holder. And they probably walked around with their lamps, letting everybody see their lamps. They had a bumper sticker on their donkey that probably said, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. They watched a lot of lamp movies. They probably listened to a lot of lamp music. And they did the thing that lamp holders do. Yet they never got the oil. I'll wait. I'll have time. 
I'll get the oil later. I'll just wait. Now, five of the virgins were wise. When they accepted their position, they understood its requirements. They understood their callings and prepared for them. They received their lamps, obtained the oil, and ensured their lanterns were ready to go. The text does not tell us how long they held on to these lanterns, but I think it's safe to imagine that there was probably some maintenance involved. I have the lamp and I have the oil, but I also have to ensure the lamp is ready at all times for the coming of the bridegroom. You see, the foolish received their lamps, but did so with disdain toward the requirements of their positions and procrastinated as other priorities pushed their way to the forefront. And the wise received their lanterns and did so with reverence for their responsibility and honored their treasured roles to meet the bridegroom. Now, there was a delay. We read this, and Jesus says this to us in this parable. There was a delay. Here, Jesus is clear. The bridegroom is delayed. Jesus is going to come, and he's going to come at any moment, but the moment is unknown. He tells us, it's going to be a while before I come back. And it's been a while. It's been about 1,993 years, and we still anxiously wait for his return. And the Apostle Peter, in his letter known as Second Peter, known to us, in chapter 3, he tells us this, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. But do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with, one, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance." But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Peter encourages his readers to know that Jesus is indeed returning. Now, avoid the interpretive error about the 1,000 years thing. Many people read that and declare some type of heavenly timeline equation, mathematical formula, that certainly a day in heaven heaven is 1,000 years on earth, and they try to do some uh, calculations based upon that. I told you about simile earlier. A day with the Lord is like 1,000 years, right? That's not equal to. So don't get lost in that. We have to remember that Jesus, that that the Trinity, they stand outside of time. God stands outside of time. He is eternal. And so when Jesus tells us there's a delay, the time of the delay is unknown, but he's coming back. That's what we know, and that's what was important for us to know, that he is certainly coming back, and that time is unknown. Now, if you've been following along with my message, you may see where this is going. Yes, Jesus is coming back. Five were wise, they were ready and watchful. Five were foolish, they were not watchful. So I can imagine in your minds, maybe you're putting together the moral of the story is that we should be watchful and ready for his return. Not quite. If that's really the lesson, then here's my question. Why did all ten sleep? Notice five were wise and the five were foolish, but they all became drowsy and slept. How did they all sleep if the lesson is simply to stay alert? Sleeping here in this parable signifies the normal, ordinary activities of life. They get up in the morning, did what they had to do, tended to their duties, their responsibilities, ensured the lamps were ready, got tired, went to bed, woke up the next day, did what they had to do, tended to their duties, their responsibilities, ensured the lamps were ready, got tired, went to bed, woke up the next day, and so on and so forth. Jesus teaches us that between his ascension and his return, he does not expect us to watch the clouds saying, oh, here he comes. Look at that one. It's shaped like a dove. He does not expect us to read the newspaper and go, oh, here it is. The president of this nation said this, or the leader of this group said that, or a law has been passed that says this. Oh, no, I'm I'm calling out of work. There's an eclipse tonight. This could be it. I'm not going in, right? That is not what Jesus is teaching us. That's chaos, That's ridiculousness. 
No, Jesus, between his ascension and his return, tells us to live out our salvation and ensure we have the necessary rest to arise the next day in faithful service and committed relationship to the King of Kings. So what does watchfulness mean? It means do what you must do in your ordinary life to stay connected with the living God. It means to surrender to the sovereign power of the Holy Spirit as he makes you more and more like Jesus. It means to embrace the narrow path rather than the wide one. It means to abide in the word of God so that you're continually transformed and your heart is filled with his teachings. It means to acknowledge Jesus' rightful place as the king of your heart and to remove yourself as the sole arbiter of truth and the master of your own life. So when he returns, whenever that may be, you will be ready to welcome the bridegroom and you too will be welcome to the marriage feast and you'll join in the eternal celebration of the new heavens and the new earth where the glory of God will shine so brightly there is quite literally no need for the sun. But there is a stern, stern warning for those of us who put off this watchfulness like the foolish virgins who did not get oil for their lamps. When the groom came, the foolish virgins went to and fro, hoping to find what they needed in the last hour, but it was too late. Notice the wise virgins did not share their oil, and I could hear some maybe legalistic people saying, oh, if they were truly Christians, they would have shared, right? They would have been loving and kind and given of what they had to the foolish virgins. But here, the heart of the story here is that I cannot, you cannot impart your readiness to someone else's heart who is not open to receive it. When you come in panic at the last moment, it's not desire for readiness that motivates you. It's fear of the consequence. And there is a consequence. Jesus makes this very clear when he shuts the door to the unwise, to the foolish, to those who said, I have plenty of time. I'll put this off to later. I just want to live my best life now. And then maybe later on after I've done thus and so, I'll get the oil for my lamp. When they, to those people, Jesus shuts the door and says, I do not know you. Later on in Matthew, we read that these individuals are cast into outer darkness and into eternal punishment. It's pretty heavy, right? So what do we walk away with this? What is the moral of the story? Well, the virgins are the visible church. Now, when I say visible church, I don't mean just Black Rock, right? Black Rock is part of the visible church. But I mean the body of believers throughout the entire world. People who fill the seats of the church. People who claim to be part of the capital C church in the world. And that Jesus is describing within the visible church, there are two types of people. There are those who are foolish, who are putting off repentance, and surrender. I am confident that there are some of us who are saying, you know, I, don't, I know that I need to go to God and I know I need to, to get my life on track with him, but you know what I'm going to do? I think I'd rather just let me just pay off my debt first. I want to get out of credit card debt first. I want to make sure all these things come in line. I want to end this relationship. I want to start this relationship. You know, I want to kick this habit, right? I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to live my life. I want to do my thing. You know, then I'll go to God and then I'll ask for forgiveness and then I'll do that. You know, I'll go to church. I'll sing the songs, right? I might even go to a small group, but in my heart, I just know I'm not quite with God. It's not really what I want to do right now. I just want to do me. I just want to be my best self. I just want to be authentic to who I am. And Jesus is giving you a very stern and warning and a wake-up call today in this parable to say, you don't know when he's coming back and you don't know the limit in the days of your life. So that do not procrastinate on the command to repent. Do not put off recognizing Christ's lordship. 
recognizing that he has offered this, this sin sacrifice, right? that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was resurrected to prove his superiority over death itself, and that he stands and he opens up his hands to you. We can't procrastinate on receiving that truth. Now, what about those of us who are wise, who have recognized Christ as king and live as, it were, as if it's so? And here's a cautionary tale from my life. In the past couple weeks, I had a fairly uh, traumatic event in which I came individually, personally, to look at death in its face. And though that I'm confident that I can rest in the arms of my loving Father and I rest in the assurance of, salvation, assurance of salvation that I have because of the finished work of Christ Jesus, I will tell you when I thought that I was approaching eternity shore, there were a lot of thoughts that filled my mind. And I began to wonder, had I really given all that I am in service to the King? I think of the words of Paul. For I've been poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Now Paul knows that it's not by his, his works that he's saved, but it's by his faith. He's, he makes it very clear to us in the New Testament. But me as a, as a pastor, as a believer who's been walking with the Lord for a long time, right? I sat and looking at my own demise and thought, Lord, I, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think that I've given you all that I, I, I have to give. I haven't poured myself out. Because there's some things in my heart that even as a Christian, I'm procrastinating on. I'm holding back on obedience in some areas or I'm not really walking in surrender. Now I know, I know that Jesus Christ has paid for my sins. But truly, are we living our lives, those of us who call ourselves Christians, in a manner that watchfully tends to the lamp? So at the moment that Jesus comes, he will catch us in the work of glorifying his name on the earth. That he will see us tending to our faith, working out our salvation, looking to please the Lord in what we say and what we do and what we think and how we move and how we breathe. That was a wake-up call for me a couple of weeks ago. I'm still working that out. But we don't have time. Because the time and the hour of his return is unknown. At any moment, he can return. Or at any moment, he can call you home. So I ask you today, those of you who are Christians, are you really tending to your lamps? Are you just comfortable with the title? And you're keeping it underneath your bed until some other things are taken care of first. For those of you today who hear the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, who are being stirred, who are uncomfortable because you recognize that you are the person that's putting things off, you're the unfoolish virgin, you're the one saying that I'm going to put off, I don't want Jesus to be the king of my life right now, I'm not ready, I need to be king, I need to be queen. Today is the day where God is saying enough. Don't get right to come to me. Come to the Lord and he will make you right. Stop waiting. Repent. Repent means to change your mind. It means to turn around. Turn around your idea that you get to be the leader of your own life and recognize Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. And for those of us who are Christians, and who are confident in our assurance of salvation, and we look forward to the day of his return, would you ask the Lord to unshackle you of anything that stands in the way of you saying what Paul says, that I have run the race, 
I have fought the good fight. Whatever stands in the way of you saying that, destroy it, remove it, annihilate it. Not in your own strength, but through prayer, through uh, community, and through dwelling in the word of God. Because we don't know when he's coming back. And his coming back ought not to frighten us. It ought to make us rejoice. So for those of you who are on either side, I'm going to pray for you now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're faithful. I thank you that you're patient. I thank you that you're long-suffering. I thank you that you have chosen the weak things to confound the wise. And so for my friends who are listening today, who recognize they've been putting off what they know they ought to do as far as recognizing your kingship, recognizing that you died for their sins, recognizing that you defeated sin and death, that you offer forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, uh, would testify to them right now that, this, that the words that, are, that they're hearing and the experience they're experiencing at home or in the car or wherever they might be, it's true and it's real and it's from your heart. And I ask that they would pray this prayer in faith And they would say, Heavenly Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I'm in need of forgiveness. I repent. I change my mind. And I ask that you would be the king of my life. And for those of my brothers and sisters who have been walking with the Lord, but perhaps there's those obstacles that prevent them or or challenge them, or a struggle, or, or whatever it might be, Lord, that other priorities have taken place or come to the forefront, or would you help them, would you empower them to gain perspective that's eternal, that their everyday actions have eternal implications. I pray for them, God, that they would surrender, that I would surrender, because, Lord, I can only preach this sermon because you first delivered it to me. And I ask this in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Jesus is returning. His return will be sudden. Stay vigilant over your relationship with God. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Resist the evil one and may your life bring glory to its maker. Have a great day.